Welcome to the digital lecture series of FU Best, the European Studies Program of Freie Universität Berlin. In 15 sessions, we will offer you a broad overview of FU Best's academic course offerings. You can choose from 12 subject course lectures representing a wide range of disciplines and three live sessions on German language and culture. Our series is divided into four themes relevant to European studies in Berlin and Germany today. Each will be dealt with by a group of FO best instructors from the perspectives of their particular disciplines or German language levels. Part 2 explores a range of concurrent national and personal identities in present-day Europe, Germany and Berlin. We will look at Germany's political role or roles in Europe, the interplay of religion and of popular culture with the identities of specific groups of Germans and the meaning of art for the creation of a national identity in Europe. All sessions will offer you insights into our instructors' semester-long regular courses within the FU Best program and the way in which they integrate Berlin as a cultural and historical location. We hope you enjoy the online program we've assembled for you. For more details about the lecture series and our regular on-site FBS program, visit our website later. You will also find additional information at the end of today's lecture. With that, enjoy the following session and see you soon in Berlin. Hello, my name is Matthias Vollmer. I'm the lecturer of this short overview into European aspects of European art. Um, and um, I studied here at the Freie University in Berlin. Um, so philosophy, as you can read here, history of art and Orientalism. Um, and now I'm lecturing at different universities um, in Germany and in the UK as well. So, and I'm with FUBEST for a while. So, yeah, our course here, or our lecture here, is yeah about aspects of European art. Uh, and then the subtitle is Treasure Hunting in Berlin. That means there is a reference to the wonderful collections of art which we have here in Berlin. Collections which are in the um, placed at the Kulturforum. Um, for example, there is the Gemälde Gallery, um, the Old Masters Gallery, and uh, another ex uh, example is the um, Museums Island, uh, so with the Alte Museum, the Neue Museum and the National Gallery, the Old National Gallery. We have also here the New National Gallery, but this uh, gallery is for a while under reconstruction. Um, artworks in Berlin are numerous and the quality of these collections definitely rivals all the other great collections over the world, just to mention the National Gallery in London, um, the Louvre um, or the MoMA in New York. Smaller in size, admittedly, but definitely um, equal in quality. So, yeah. If you study art, uh, you also study history. Art and history are in a certain way intertwined because artworks quite often respond uh, to historical situations. And some of these historical situations we will look at through some artworks. So we will start here in our context um, with um, a piece from the National Gallery, the old National Gallery from the Museum's Island, um, and that is Caspar David Friedrich's famous Monk by the Sea. The context, the art context, is Romanticism. Um, this piece here is a seascape, or a landscape, and, and but it is in a certain way a piece where 
not a lot of things are actually going on. We see a huge amount of sky, we see a small stripe of water, and we see a shore. Um, and at the shore, and nearly disappearing in the darkness, we see the solitary figure of a monk, the monk by the sea. What is expressed here? It is expressed is, for example, so there are different, diff, um, different possibilities, expressed here is actually a kind of emotional approach to the um, subjective feelings of the individual in the context of the landscape. And the landscape slash seascape actually is corresponding with the possible emotional feelings of this um, solitary figure on the shore. The, con the wider context of Romanticism in Germany, in our context here, is um, that Romanticism or some pieces of Romanticism do reflect the political situation in Germany. That means the old German Empire, the Holy German Empire of German nation, came at 1806, caused by Napoleon, and then Napoleonic Wars to an end. And the Germans now started to long for a kind of national identity. France had a national identity, a national state, England as well, but the Germans sadly not. And they were looking around for a kind of exemplary time where they had a kind of greatness. And that were medieval times. So that is why we have in Germany so many medieval topics in these times. And Caspar David Friedrich, so here with one of his most famous, as I mentioned it before, pieces depicted also uh, like his contemporary, um, and some of his contemporaries, uh, pieces with medieval topics, medieval settings, medieval cath Gothic cathedrals. The Gothic became actually the another word for yeah the pure German. Um, so another very important painter in this context is Philip or was Philip Otto Runge. So and Philip Otto Runge, um, um, we will come to him in a moment, uh, created an entirely new approach to art. But if we, let's focus again here on Caspar David Friedrich. What we have here expressed in his pieces is a search for the divine in nature. We have an entirely new importance of landscapes. It is about the loneliness of man on earth and subjectivity and creativity as the driving forces for the arts became very eminent. The key words here are definitely feeling, intuition, individuality, and spirituality. And all this is embedded in these artworks and is also or became also part of the, let's say, historical reflection of the developments in Germany. Um, we have then here, I mentioned him before, Philipp Otto Runge. Philipp Otto Runge, with his unique approach to the um, common art historical symbolism, because he started to slightly change the symbolic language, developing an entirely new symbolic language, which makes his pieces um, sometimes a little bit difficult to understand if you follow the yeah, let's say the common expectations. So, for example, uh, for example, you see on the base um, on both of these pieces um, on the ground a naked toddler, and you might expect, oh my God, that could be following usual iconography symbolism. That could be baby Jesus, but no, it is not. It is in a certain way the rebirth of mankind which we see here. And Philip Otto Runge's idea was 
with his art to connect man, to connect history, to connect everything with God for the sake of making the world a better place. And this very romantic, idealistic approach um, um, reappeared then in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, especially in the context of the art of Joseph Boys. We will come to him in a few moments. Um, another crucial um, um, individual of these times was the philosopher Arto Schopenhauer. Yes, I know, they are definitely in the context of the history of philosophy, um, more important philosophers like Immanuel Kant or Georg Friedrich Wilhelm Hegel, uh, the great rival from Schopenhauer's point of view of his. But Schopenhauer, and that is why he is here, um, created an absolutely unique approach of understanding art or approach or to define the role of art. What does this mean? Give me a moment. His main work was the world as will and representation. That means they are just two main principles um, in, <laughs> yeah, in everything uh, which constitute the universe. That is the will, and that is representation. Full stop. You say you were saying it is very very simple what we have there about the will. We know firsthand because we all know what it is, how it feels to will something. And representation is about how actually do things do the world appears to us. What actually uh, is our mindset to understand the world? A very subjective, idealistic um, approach which we have. Subjective, subjectivity is here another key word. We will come back to this as well. Um, so, Schopenhauer then said, in all these reflections, it has been my object to bring out clearly the nature and the scope of the subjective element in aesthetic pleasure. The deliverance of knowledge from the service of the will, the forgetting of self as an individual, and the raising of consciousness to the pure will, this timeless subject of knowledge independent of all relations. That is from the third part of his book. It is about the object of art. So, for Schopenhauer, um, art does not represent the merely material and empirical, but rather the ideas that lie behind it. So that means art is not just, just to represent something. Art, in a certain way, goes behind the things. Art aims at the idea of something. A significant work of art is not concerned with a particular but rather with a universal idea that stands behind it at its reality. Science is necessarily limited to the realm of appearance. Art can reveal metaphysical truth. Art shows what true philosophy says. And that is a very important sentence. Art shows what true Biff's philosophy says. That means art visualize was true philosophy says. And art is even more important than science because art looks behind the things and art can actually express this. You can imagine that this was all, <laughs> that this was very attractive to later art, um, artists um, um, writers as well. So in the beginning Schopenhauer's um, success was not really there, but at the end of his uh, long life um, his success actually started. Nietzsche was deeply influenced, just to na name one philosopher influenced by Schopenhauer, so Schopenhauer was actually um, his 
teacher, as he said it, um, not directly. Um, so, and a lot of modern artists were influenced by Schopenhauer, just to mention Max Beckmann, um, to make, mention Max Klingel, to mention uh, Vladimir Malevich, and others. Um, all right. To give you an example, here we have Max Klinger with his famous sculpture of Ludwig van Beethoven housed in the Museum für Bildende Kunst in Leipzig, not so far away from Berlin. An easy day trip. We have different materials here, um, but that's right now not so overly important. Important for us is here what is expressed and how can you express this Schopenhauerian approach with so much material. Because we have just heard science is necessarily limited to the realm of appearance. So realm, realm of appearance we have here as well, the materiality. But it is, sorry, it is what is expressed actually here. So that means we see the deaf composer leaning forward. We see him in a very unusual depiction in these times. That means more or less half naked uh, and in a pose of a Greek god, Zeus, enthroned the eagle in front of him. So here we have another view and you could really think, oh my god, that's a little bit unusual and he looks not like not hero-like, with a strong body. He looks slightly frail, you might say, in comparison to these Greek gods. Um, what, what is expressed here? He is leaning forwards as if to listen. But we know he was deaf. He couldn't hear. So that means he couldn't listen. To what is he listening? He is listening into the realm of ideas. So it is about the immateriality of art. And that is expressed with yeah, a huge amount of artistic materiality, if you want to express it like this. So, listening into the realm of ideas and creating then some of the greatest and most important um, pieces of music we have ever heard. Um, so, and Max, Max Klinger was definitely, not in theory, but we know it by his letters and we even have his copy of Schopenhauer's World as Will and present, Representation, he was deeply influenced by Schopenhauer. So, and our dear Beethoven reappears here for us then in the context of the Vienna Secession, so Art Nouveau Secession in 1902 uh, in this again, exhibition. So, and this exhibition, the 14th exhibition, was dedicated to Beethoven. And at the opening, Gustav Mahler conducted Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 9, surrounded by marvelous artworks. Uh, so, for example, by artworks of Gustav Klimt. Klimt, we have here, represented with the kiss. It is a, a very common piece. So it is, you can say, in appearance very decorative. But if you look beyond this, then you realize that this is also a very ambiguous piece. Because is he just, or is, are they just about to kiss? So to take it literally, they do not kiss, they are about to kiss. And is look how he is holding her with his strong hands and how strong her head uh, is in her back. Her eyes are closed, but her lips are also firmly closed. She is on her toes, if we look closely to the upper right. Um, so, is she giving in or does she have second thoughts? We will never know. It depends how you want to interpret it. The two bodies 
are merged into one golden form, but two, the two parts, two bodies actually, are emphasized by the patterns, the, right, the white and black rectangles on the male side, and the circles and the um, colorful flowers on the female side. Uh, so they are a whole and they are separated. It is a kiss, it is a mutual kiss, or it is not a kiss. So are they about to da da dum da da dum? Um, so we will never know, but that is, it is open. But we see there behind the just, the behind the appearance uh, are a lot of possibilities of interpretation. The pupils of Klimt was one of the most famous pupils of Klimt was Egon Schiele, whom we see here. And he was turning away from the Art Nouveau appearance, which we have actually seen here. So he was the first to express himself in a way which we call nowadays Austrian Expressionism. And here again we have a very deep focus on subjectivity, a very deep focus on feeling, um, on emotions, um, but not anymore in a philosophical way, but much more in a very personal way, more, even more subjective. Emphasis, as we can clearly see, is here on the brushwork, uh, which you can easily see in the depiction of his face, the blotches, which we can see here of colors, and if you look at his shirt, there you see the different movements of the brush, the gesture becomes important. And that's where we switch over to here German Expressionism. There we have Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. So depicting here in this piece the group um, of his Expressionist colleagues Müller, Kirchner, Heckel and Schmidt, Rudloff. And that was depicted after the end of this group. The Brücke. The Brücke um, here um, is uh, just one um, part of German Expressionism. The other one was the Blue Rider. So Led was the Brücke by Ernst Ludwig Kirchner and the Blue Rider by Vasily Kandinsky. Express Expressionism in general, you can say, was an early 20th century German art movement that emphasized the artist in the feelings, emotions, or ideas over reproducing reality. It is characterized by simplified shapes, bright colors, and gestural marks or brushstrokes. Here we see Kirchner with his piece from Hamburg, also not so far away from Berlin, just two hours with the train in the Kunsthalle. And that is an early Kirchner, so it radiates let's say, positive emotions, with the emphasis on orange, on red, on violet and blue, which we have here, so, and also merging and mixing these colors. And we see a kind of bohemian scenery here in his atelier. Uh, you can assume that he probably was just sitting there close to the model, having a conversation. Um, and that is why we see his pink lips and the pink is all over her face and shoulders as well. You can draw there a connection. And at some point he just stood up and decided um, to paint a self-portrait. Uh, and we can also see that he wears a robe and underneath he is quite obviously naked. Um, so, yes, just a conversation it was, as I said. Um, so, bohemian art life is depicted in a positive way and the dear girl uh, remains slightly bedraggled um, on her, on the sofa. Um, a few years later, uh, that was here in 1910, in 1914, um, we have this piece by Kirchner 
the famous women at Potsdamer Platz, uh, Frauen am Potsdamer Platz, which is a piece from another museum in Berlin, the Neue National Gallery. And here we have an entirely different approach to express himself. The forms are much more sharp and angular. The colors he's using here are not this warm and radiant, radiant, gleaming colors, gray, blue, greens, but you could say dirty grays, dirty blues, dirty reds, what we have. So, and we see this two um, women on the center there on this kind of traffic island at Potsdamer Platz. And by the way they are dressed, we can deduce that they might be prostitutes. And one of the men is about to step over um, and perhaps to have a talk uh, with them. Um, it is actually a kind of depiction of life on Potsdamer Platz. Here we have a contemporary, that means 1912, contemporary photography of Potsdamer Platz. And we see some of the buildings actually here, which we uh, can observe in the Kirchen as well. To the left, we have the Hotel Fürstenhof in the background. So the building with the um, dome, the cafe Piccadilly, Piccadilly um, and or House Vaterland. Um, and then we have uh, this building with the huge uh, colonnades that is Potsdamer Bahnhof. Um, and here, if we put it together, then you could even um, hear there that is the Cafe Piccadilly, Potsdamer Bahnhof, and here there is even the beer house, the Pshaw house, which we have there as well. So, and that's another contemporary and later colored um, depiction of Potsdamer Platz. But what it is what Kirchner wants to express here? He wants to express in a certain way a feeling of isolation, of loneliness. Um, that means there is Oh, there are many people together on this huge place, but they are not really together. It is just about business. City life is a life of alienation and isolation. Um, and that is what is expressed here. Love, if you want to call it, has become something, turned into something which you believe you can buy, social contacts you can buy. Uh, so that means um, that is not anymore a kind of peace which we can, which might be connotated as positively, emotional positively, as this. Um, all right, the other branch of expressionism was the Blue Rider. And the main representative in our context here is Vasily Kandinsky, here with his famous composition Deluge. And there we see Expressionism with his two branches is on the one hand side depicting representative objective pieces. It is yeah, a kind of representative painting and here now we have an abstract painting. Depicted is a whirl and swirl of colors, forms and lines. Uh, whirling, swirling around so that you got the idea that is a kind of chaos. But if you look longer into it, then you start to feel into the painting. And if you are Kandins Kandinsky, you start actually to hear what is going on. He was a synesthetic. That means if he saw a color, he could hear the color. And that means you should try to imagine to hear what you see. All these art movements I mentioned so far were or took place for a great part in Berlin. So the artists moved from Dresden or München, uh, Munich uh, to Berlin. So, and there Berlin became actually a center of artistic 
in our context, um, artistic activity. Certainly, they were the secessions in Munich as well. Munich was also the center, but we here focus on Berlin. Franz Marc then, uh, here with his tiger and also part of the Blue Rider, and not as abstract as um, Kandinsky was. Definitely not, because we can easily recognize the tiger. And what he is trying to express here, you can say, is the tigerness of the tiger. So the cat, which has just rested, is about to turn around and to get up. His behind is still resting, the middle part is moving upwards, and the shoulder and his head are, in a certain way, about to move on. Uh, so that means we have rest and movement in one part, and we have a kind of splittering yeah, the world, the objects, into um, planes of colors, uh, but what you immediately feel is the very nature of the tiger. That means that he is a predator and he might turn around and jump out of the painting and eat what get in his way. The tiger is of the tiger. So Franz Marc mostly focusing on, the, or for a while, focusing on depicting animals because animals saying, much, much uh, Franz Marc saying that, do never lie, and men, humans, do lie. Um, so, Franz Marc, um, as I said, also part of the Blue Rider, the other part of German Expressionism. Also an important art movement, which also yeah, moved uh, to Berlin, um, uh, in the end, was the Bauhaus. In a certain way, you can say an international art movement, because uh, a lot of artists uh, from everywhere in Germany and even from other countries started to join the Bauhaus and teach there. The Bauhaus itself was a school of design, architecture and applied art that existed in Germany from 1919 to 1933. It was based in Weimar until 1925 and Dessau through 1932 and finally in Berlin in its final month in 1933. After that, um, the Bauhaus was closed, shut down uh, by the Nazis, um, the National Socialists, um, and the Bauhaus artists are spread over the world, mostly um, America and England. And here we have a model of the Dessau Bauhaus, so in its time an absolutely revolutionary and highly influential architecture, with one of the first glass facades in architecture, as you can see here with this building. That's one of the Bauhaus artists, Oskar Schlemmer, depicting the Bauhaus stairway. On the right hand you see a photo of the Bauhaus stairway and Oskar Schlemmer just focusing on the appearance and shapes of the figures, but not trying to capture any kind of indiv individuality. A very international art movement uh, with a strong focus uh, in Berlin was Dada. Um, Dada has also to be understood in the context of World War I. Uh, so a lot of um, the artists we have talked about were in one or the other way involved with the First World War, so and a lot of them actually died in combat. So Sigmund Freud said about the First World War, no event in history confused so many of the clearest intelligences. So um, that's definitely true also for, you might say, any kind of war. So it was in this context that Dada, perhaps one of the most influential art movements of the 20th century, emerged serving as both a symptom of and antidote to that confusion. 
Dadaists sought to overthrow all arts of the past along with all its attendant snobbery and hierarchies. From 1960 on, anything and everything could be considered art. And that is something which is of uh, great importance. Uh, so everything could be considered as art. That is also the context of Marcel Duchamp um, with his fountain. So that means the upturned um, urinal which we have. So it is not anymore what the object is, but what is behind the object. Sounds familiar in a certain way? Yes, because we have heard art is depicting or expressing what is behind it or behind the object. Depends on what the, you, how you define the behind. But Schopenhauer was aiming at this with a, a quietly, very, very different understanding. But nevertheless, so considered arts, not about the objects itself. Here we have two of the main representatives, that's Raoul Hausmann and Hannah Höch, here at the first international Dada Fair in Berlin, um, 1920. Um, here, starting Dada, we have uh, in 1916 in, in Zurich, is Hugo Ball. Hugo Ball on stage in a costume like this is actually, sorry, <laughs> is actually reading a poem. And this sounds so. Caravane, jolly fanto bambla o fali bambla, grossi gam fa babla orem, e giga gorame ne go bloi gurusula uyo, holla ka holla la, on lo go boom, bla go boom, bla go boom. Bosso fata ka scampa bulla vu suolobo, e tata gorem, e si che zumbara, vulobo, subotu, ulof subotu, Dumba ba ums, kusa gauma ba ums. Yeah, I hope that was clear. Um, whatever, it is not about what you recognize. It is about what you imagine. You might think, oh my God, that's absolutely nonsense. Yes, you're right. That is absolutely nonsense. But this nonsense is full of sense, and you have to figure out what the sense is on your own. So, use your head, you might say. That is one of the most important messages of data, of art in general. Um, here we have Hannah Höch with her famous piece Schnitt mit dem Küchenmesser Dada durch die letzte Weimarer Bierbauch Kulturepoche Deutschlands in English. Cut with a kitchen knife through the last Weimar beer belly cultural epoch in Germany. So it is a photomontage and collage with watercolor, so an entirely new way to depict something on a flat surface. Hannah Höch was successful, but she had actually to fight against her colleagues, uh, so the standing of women in art was in this times uh, very, very difficult. Um, so, and she was actually, Hannah Hoch, praised by George Gross, her colleague George Gross, because of her wonderful sandwiches. Um, we would praise her because of her wonderful artworks. And here we see a kind of depiction of what Weimar here um, in 1919 was through the eye of Hannah Höch. We see a kind of kaleidoscope of yeah, single objects put together and by this actually reflecting how we experience reality. We do not experience reality as a flow of things, as a whole image. We have a lot of tiny little fractured impressions um, which we put together so that they make sense. And that is in a certain way what Dada Höch um, uh, wanted to um, express to show us here as well. This new way of thinking about time and place um, so, and thinking about the world as a very complex cosmos um, of sense and nonsense.
somebody who was also looking at the reality of the time with a very uh, sharp, keen eye, some even say with an evil eye, was Otto Dix, here with a self-portrait, um, with easel, and we, you might perhaps imagine, if you look, how he is actually gazing at us, that this could be the evil eye, because he is not looking out for beauty. He was part of the art movement of new objectivity. Um, so that means after all this abstraction, we have now, have now an artwork which is focusing on depicting um, again things as they appear. But not only as they appear, but Otto Dix stripping away everything which you might consider as beautiful and focusing on the reality. And here we have a focus on the reality in 1920. Please realize we are um, here in the two years after the end of the First World War and the streets uh, or on the streets you could see a huge amount of horrible mutilated people, mostly men, soldiers, former soldiers, who are trying trying to make a living. What you can see here, you might say, is the face of war. If you believe that this is a little bit over the top, um, then I can only say, please study the images of the time of this poor, tortured and mangled persons and bodies, and then you will see that Otto Dix is definitely not overemphasizing how um, these people looked like in these times. As I said, the face of war. Um, but we have also a piece like this, his very famous portrait of the journalist Sylvia von Harden, emphasizing with his evil eye not the beauty of the person, but in a certain way overemphasizing attributes, overemphasizing the size of her hands, um, overemphasizing the form of her lips, the, her nose, her beak like nose, and putting onto or in front of one of her eyes a kind of monocle like a magnifying glass. There she is, not caring about a very proper um, and posh appearance. No, we can see her stockings uh, actually not uh, tidy, um, not very uh, slightly untidy stockings. Uh, the emphasis on her hands, on her mouth, on her nose, um, are do emphasize in a certain way her profession as a journalist. Hands for typing, mouth for words nose for poking in and the monocle for, in a certain way, scrutinizing. So she becomes by this the very image of an investigating female journalist in a male-dominated world, um, which is also emphasized um, by her haircut. Uh, so, And there you see his evil eye is evil in the sense that he is not looking out for beauty, but in a certain way that he is focusing on actually what a person is. And that is not about beauty, that is in a certain way about the person's abilities and gifts and possibilities. Another artist which is important in, this con uh, in our context is Paul Klee. Um, here with one of his pieces, The Angelus Novos, that is the angel of history. And there again we have this, in a certain way, um, this connection between art and history. And there we have a wonderful uh, quote by the philosopher Walter Benjamin, uh, who actually owned for a while this piece, uh, and he wrote in his thesis on philosophy of history, a clay painting named Angelus Novos 
shows an angel looking as though he is about to move away from something he is fixedly contemplating. His eyes are staring, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. This is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned toward the past, where we perceive a chain of events. Events he sees one single catastrophe which keeps piling wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay awake in the dead and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing in from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such a violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm is irresistibly, the storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. Max Beckmann, I mentioned him, also influenced by Schopenhauer, depicting here in his very unique way in the small death scene, the death of his mother. The display of emotions um, uh, and of despair and of loneliness in this moment is captured brilliantly, a small piece which we have in the old National Gallery. It is in this years this Beckmann or Beckmann is close to German Expressionism. But after all this experience of yeah, um, avant-garde art movements, then something happens and that is the Nazis seizing power. And the Nazis laid latest from the let's say 1933 on started to purge as they called it the German, German German museums of works the party considered to be degenerate and that means all of the artworks okay with the exception of Caspar David Friedrich um, and Philip Otto Runge were considered we have seen here in this uh, um, lecture, um, were considered as degenerate. So thousands of artworks were removed, 650 chosen for a special exhibit of Antarctica Kunst. And this exhibition then traveled through Germany and Austria so that all people could actually experience what not proper German art was. And here we have a quote from the um, opening of the exhibition in 1937 in Munich. We now stand on an exhibition that contains only a fraction of what was bought with the hard-earned savings of the German people and exhibited as art by a large number of museums all over Germany. All around us you see the monstrous offspring of insanity, impudence and aptitude and sheer degeneracy. What this exhibition offers inspires horror and disgust in us all. Censorship on its peak, what we have here, a glimpse, just one glimpse into uh, the exhibition. There you can see how the pieces were on display and there even the Dada quote, Nehmen Sie Dada ernst, es lohnt sich, take Dada serious, it's worth it. Um, and then we see the Dada pieces around it. So, and, the, and you can see how close to each other the artworks were placed. So it is not about that you could actually enjoy the artworks. You should just learn what a kind of um, nonsense um, that is what the artist reproduced here. Um, the question remains, what is then proper German art? And they decided, the Nazis, to, or the National Socialists, decided to come up with an answer in an exhibition that means the uh, Große Deutsche Kunstausstellung. Uh, so also in Munich, 1937. So um, you see the bronze head of um, Adolf Hitler by Bernhard Blicher, and on the right hand, uh, corner, you see um, the um, uh, Hitler and his followers and looking at proper German art. 
All right, but then what is proper German art? For something like this, for example. A monkey scratching his head, a pelican, and an elk at night, somewhere on a meadow, whatever, in a wood. Yes, that is German art. Um, in these times, considered by the Nazis, and strong focus on the picture of the female nudie, uh, nude, but also not the female, but also the male nude. And we see this overly aggressive, muscular man depicted, depicting, uh, in a certain way, the new Aryan um, German um, as well as it is depicted here with the female bodies. Um, anyhow, um, after the war, and now that's a big jump, <laughs> after the war, as you all know, Germany was divided in the eastern Western part, um, and here we start with an example from Wolfgang Matteuer, East Germany, uh, the GDR, uh, a piece with the title Behind the Seven Mountains, Hinter den Sieben Bergen. So, and we see a motorway, in a certain way, a motorway going into or with the direction to the depth of the painting and behind the horizon we see the apparition of a female um, body so and obviously she is holding some balloons uh, and some flowers in her hands um, and definitely reminding us at Eugene Delacroix's La Liberté guidant le peuple um, so liberty leading the people uh, from Paris at the Louvre. So that means it is Miss Liberty which we have here and they are driving and Miss Liberty perhaps is here in the West and is this promising of liberty from the West really what we should aim at? It is, is it not just an apparition? That is what perhaps Matoya was asking us. A promise which will never be fulfilled because it is just an apparition. A fairy tale behind the seven mountains. Or Snow White and the dwarfs. Uh, so that's are the references here. So art and history and politics. Um, but on the West, again, you could say abstraction became and um, again, a very important topic. Here we have Günther Uecker, so uh, with his yellow picture. It's just nails and oil on canvas. And what we see here is an attempt to depict energy. Yellow radiates energy. So you could say the it is it becomes the depiction a depiction of the sun but this sun is contained in the frame or um, of the piece uh, of the artwork um, so that means um, it is held in check by the nails but not also not only by the nails but also by the energy with which the nails are driven into um, the wood. Uh, so that means into this, uh, containing it from um, all four sides, the energy going in and the energy radiating. And so we have a balance of energy. Um, so the frame of uh, for the canvas, so uh, holding in a certain way the nails, the nails are driven in, the yellow in a certain way starting to in a certain way expand but it can't because it hold in check it is hold in balance so it is about or how to depict energy or to depict a kind of balance of different energies and then we have baselitz um, georg baselitz here with his piece the wood in a headstand um, so Baselitz was thinking about new ways to depict or to create abstraction. And he was saying, what do we need to have a kind of abstraction? For him, it is like the following. 
The object expresses nothing at all. Painting is not a means to an end. On the contrary, painting is autonomous. And I said to myself, if this is the case, then I must take everything which has been an object of painting, landscape, the portrait, the nude, for example, and paint it upside down. That is the best way to liberate representation from content. I wanted the picture taken away from the fatal dependence to reality. The painting itself, itself should move into the spotlight regardless of the motive. So that means by turning it upside, it is not anymore a wood, it's a wood and a headstand, with this, which is an impossibility. Yeah. Um, so, and by this, the piece, the painting is still there, something is depicted, but this something has no content at all, at all anymore. It is contentless by just turning it upside. So if you turn something around, it is not anymore what it was before, um, and then it is something different, but it is up to you what it could be. But back to dealing with history. After the Second World War, um, artists tried to deal with the German past of the 1930s and 1940s. Anselm Kiefer is here one artist who did this in very different approaches. So here we have um, Kiefer's ways of worldly wisdom, his Arminius battle. So what we have here, or what Kiefer said about this, I choose these personages because power abused them. The fire may allude to Nazi book burnings or could suggest a new Germany rising from the ashes of the past. What we see here is a collection of portraits depicted um, woodcut-like um, and they, these portraits are connected by these black lines and in the center of the piece, we see also woodcut-like a fire, a burning fire. So woodcut, wood, fire, and then you might see the growing rings, the growth rings of, um, um, of a tree. And the title, the Hermans of the Armenius battle, where the following aspects or <laughs> interpretation of German history, different times. Uh, the Germans for the first times were united by Armenius to fight back and overcome uh, two Roman legions. Um, so, and that was considered then as the birth of the German nation in a kind of national and nationalistic context, uh, so the founding moment of their German nationhood. So that is how some people, how intellectuals and scientists and politicians and theologians actually interpreted this um, moment in history. And so creating a kind of national German history. And probably this was misused, um, this approach, in the context um, um, of, let's say, uh, or especially in the context of the Third Reich. But Hans Kiefer here referred much more directly to the most horrible um, event um, in German history, if I am allowed to say it like this, um, and that is the Holocaust. Here we have a piece title is um, on the piece itself, Dein goldenes Haar Margarete, and that's the title of this artwork, Your Golden Hair Margaret. Um, and that is a quote from a poem of Paul Celan, so a kind of, re, um, as and Celan wrote The Death Fook, which, uh, and there, in The Death Fook, he is describing events in a concentration camp. So, and 
the prisoners singing this refrain, uh, your golden hair, Margaret. Margaret, Margaret, probably a reference to Grete, Gretchen. So Gretchen, Faust, Goethe, high German culture on the one hand side, um, and the, then it goes on, your golden hair, Margaret, your ashen hair, Schulamit. And that means the golden hair, Margaret, the German aspect, and then Ashen hair, Shulamit, the Jewish aspect, and so creating this juxtaposition. So, and we see the yellow straw, probably, and behind the yellow straw, we see the, in, um, highlighted in black, this kind of blackish arch, uh, so probably the two colors of hair, which we have here, golden and ashen, and that is the context here is the Holocaust, and that was 1981. Um, but we should not forget, and I mentioned him, that is Joseph Beuys. Uh, so probably one of the most important and influential German artists in the 20th century. Um, he is quite well known uh, for his um, actions and performances, and here we have um, one very interesting performance, and that is how to explain pictures to a dead hare. And we see here Boyce himself seated on a chair, holding in his arms, cradling in his arms a dead hare. Um, his head is covered with honey and gold leaf, and then he was walking around in this gallery and trying to, so it seems, explain these artworks on the walls. Um, to um, the dead hair. You really might, you might think, oh my god, what is going on there? It is, in a certain way, about boy's role as an artist and as a shaman. So that means he, as an artist, had a special belief to have a special ability to, in a certain way, with, with, with which he could explain, in a certain way, things um, in which he to even an hair, or that means he his role as an artist was in a certain way to close the gap, the spiritual gap between, you could say, all the different things. So we should think about not the world as a collection of separate objects, but everything actually is in a certain way together. It is about the world, the environment, it is about nature, it is about resources, and it is about our responsibility. And we, and the artists, are part of the big social plastic. And that is what he, as an artist, is working on. The social plastic is the community. The social plastic is, in a certain way, the res responsibility which we have to take for our world. And art plays an important role to um, yeah, explain how everything actually is connected um, to each other. Um, so that is uh, just a few aspects of this very complex ideas of his that is the social plastic. But his aim was and that is now the connection back to Rungel, to make the world a better place. Philip Otto Rungel wanted to make with his artworks the world a better place. And, and he was a romantic, as we have heard. And here we see, in this case, in this context, we can consider boys as well as a romantic. Because he believed that he, with his art, or art in general, should, could make the world a better place. Um, so, um, critical art, we have here with Valley Export with her tap and touch cinema as well, so female art. So, and Export wore a tiny movie theatre around her naked upper body so that her body could not be seen but could be touched by anyone reaching through the curtain front of the theatre. 
She then went into the street and invited men, women and children to come and touch her through the portable curtain contraption for 30 seconds per person. So that means offering her body or part of her body to the public, but on the other hand it is hidden in a box. So as usual, um, the film or if film, you could even, is shown in the dark. But the cinema has shrunk somewhat, only two hands fit inside it. To see, that is to feel and touch the film, the viewer, the user, so because the cinema box, um, has to stretch his hands through the entrance, through the curtain to the, ci to the cinema. At last, the curtain, which formerly rose only for the eyes, now rises for both hands. The tactile reception of the opposite of the deceit of voyeurism. For as long as the citizen is satisfied their reproduced copy of sexual freedom, the state is spared the sexual revolution. Tap and touch cinema is an example of how reinterpretation can activate the public. So Valley export about her aim. And our last artist in this context is Gerhard Richter, and here in front of his Birkenau cycle, which is now at the Bundestag, former Reichstag, uh, so um, these four panels which we have here. What is this about? Principally, Richter is one of the most important, or probably the most important, uh, German artist right now, uh, um, active for a while. <laughs> um, and yeah, here with his Birkenau um, pieces, he was actually going back to his earlier approach to art, that means taking photos and transferring the photos or the photographs onto the canvas, so that means repainting them. But what he did then here was he was not only repainting the pieces, he was then overpainting the pieces. Which pieces? these pieces. So what we have here are anonymously taken photos of the um, uh, of what happens here in the concentration camp, camp in Auschwitz. Um, and four of these photos were smuggled out um, of the concentration camp, then later published, and Richter took these photos and transferred them to the canvas. That was for him a very painful and slowly process. But then he was not only depicting them on the canvas, he was then starting to apply colors onto the pieces. So again and again, scraping it off again, so not entirely off. So that means working with a squeegee on it into it with one of his um, techniques, special techniques, um, and then, yeah. Um, covering the photo with these different layers of applied and partly scraped off and smeared colors, gray, blue, green, um, um, and red, as we have here. So why that? Because beneath the surface still we have the photos or the, in a certain way, transferred photos. What we have here we could understand as a kind of metaphor what history is. History goes on. The events, never mind how ghastly and awful they are, um, time goes on and it is left, these um, events are left back in history, but in a certain way they are still there. So. Oh, we have layer and layer of new event, events, but the old events still lurk somewhere under the surface. So, and that's even if we don't see them anymore, they are, and they should not be forgotten because they have a kind of hidden presence. And what we are, what we have here is then, so, in the connection of Germany, um, um, yeah, this hidden presence, this painful hidden presence 
of the Holocaust, uh, of the concentration camps, of the death camps, of the mass murders, um, um, which took place in this horrible time of German history. And Richter was trying to deal in his way with this. And by this you could say, to come to an end, art is not only visualizing in a way of illustrating um, history, art can also, in a certain way, reflect upon history so that we start again about history from a different point of view. That means this visualization and not illustration, this visualization of aspects of history, of cultural, if we want to call it like this, cultural events uh, can be put into the context of art, can become the content of an artwork, even if we don't see it at the first glance. And by this, you could say, art becomes a way to express cultural um, aspect, aspects, which could be perhaps other ways, other ways not be expressed like this. So that means, Art is a way to express, in a very subjective and emotional way, way, history. History is not only about the, the bare facts of something. Um, as important as facts are is, so facts are very, very important. But on the other hand, we have, in a certain way, um, what actually or how actually history is experienced. And this experience is, in a certain way, always connected to subjective experiences and to emotions. And these subjective experiences and emotions are expressed in artworks. Uh, artworks. And this is what you can wonderfully study here in our treasure hunt, uh, not only in Berlin, but as we have seen also in Hamburg and in Leipzig, not so far away from Berlin. And by this, you can get a wonderful understanding on the one hand side of the development of art in general and of art in Germany in the Berlin or in the German capital Berlin. Thank you for your attention and hopefully, <laughs> forgive me, um, for your attention and goodbye. We hope you enjoyed this week's lecture. You can find the dates and descriptions for all sessions in our digital lecture series, as well as information about our instructors and their courses on our website. Also connect with us on social media and attend one of our informational webinars. Thank you very much for watching and we hope to see you again soon online or on site here in Berlin.